and welcome people this morning. It's uh, uh, February 4th. Uh, I'm gonna call the meeting to order uh, pursuant to rule, meeting to order for state government finance and uh, elections pursuant to rule, House Rule 10.01. We are holding this meeting virtually. Um, with that, I will ask the committee legislative assistant to take the roll. Chair Nelson. I'm here. Vice Chair Carlson. Present. Representative Nash. Present. Representative Bonner. Present. Representative Drazkowski. Present. Representative Elkins. Representative Greenman. Present. Representative Cleborn. Present. Representative Kosnick. Representative Mason. Representative New Brindley. Present. Representative Pulaski. Pulaski present. Representative Kwong. Present. Uh, Representative New Brindley. Oh. Present. And Representative Mason. I see you're in the participants list. Present. A quorum is present. Thank you, Ms. Sprick. Um, the next we have on our next thing on our agenda is the approval of the minutes from February 2nd, 2021. Um, Representative Greenman, did you get a chance to look at the minutes? I did, Mr. Chair. So moved. Uh, Representative Greenman, a move to approval of the minutes from February 2nd, 2021. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes have been approved. Uh, we have three, three bills on our agenda for today, members. And uh, um, hopefully we can get through all three. Um, it's the, they're, Ones we've heard a couple of we've, we've of these we've, we've heard before, um, but, but so we'll start with uh, Representative Bonner, House File 66, and Representative Bonner, if you want to introduce your bill, and uh, um, then we'll go to your testimony. Representative Bonner, Mr. Mr. Chair, I would like to move House File uh, 66 to be laid over for possible inclusion. Representative Bonner moves House File 66 for possible inclusion. Um, Explain your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, so, I, I, <laughs> excuse me. The bill provides for a legislative commission for cybersecurity, comprised of equal representation on a bicameral, bipartisan basis from the House and Senate. Uh, the legislative commission will focus on modernizing the best practices around cybersecurity. Uh, the intent is to focus on the preservation and maintenance of state assets, most notably infrastructure and data, both for our state and our citizens. But we must ensure that citizens of Minnesota know that their tax dollars in this area will be spent wisely, that their investments in government prudent, and most importantly, that they can rely on state government to deliver the core services that they expect. Here's what we know about cyber criminals. They don't take the day off nor do they pack it up and go home. In fact, they poke and they prod until they find the weak spot in our defenses, and they consider it a point of pride to exploit those vulnerabilities. So why should Minnesotans in the legislature be worried about cybersecurity? In an era where data breaches have become commonplace, phishing scams pervasive, and ransomware attacks have crippled state government agencies, such as the one that brought down the city of Atlanta to their knees costing taxpayers a whopping $17 million in cleanup costs. It disrupted daily functions to critical, critical to citizens, from police records to judicial systems, and hindered essential revenue collection. In Maryland and South Carolina, new and aggressive ransomware shut down all but essential services. Here at home, COVID-19 and civil unrest has made Minnesota a target. In April of 2020, we saw an increase of 30% in cases for the Sec State Security Operations Center. In June, Minnesota saw a flood of denial of service attacks. 
And while Minute was able to thwart the impact to public websites, attacks that keep Minnesotans from getting information during a pandemic is never acceptable, no matter how slight. Our citizens must be able to rely on the safety and the security of government services. And let us not forget the Minnesota Senate website was hacked by the infam infamous anonymous, causing the site to go down and having it to be rebuilt page by page. In 19, er, 2019, 43 states in Puerto Rico introduced almost 300 bills to cyber relating to cybersecurity. 31 of those states enacted cybersecurity legislation. In short, the influence of IT in our modern work is indisputable. The need to protect our assets, immeasurable. Most notably, the services and data our citizens rely on from state government while protecting and securing private information. Members, the time to lay the foundation for a strong state cybersecurity is now. And with that, Mr. Chair, I would like, and members, I would like to turn it over to my testifiers. And I have a list of testifiers. I have a list of testifiers here. The first on my list is, I'm gonna butcher this name, but Rohit Tandon. I hope I guys said that right. Um, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Chair Nelson and members. For the record, my name is Rohit Tandon and I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for Minnesota IT Services, or MINUTE. Thank you for the opportunity to provide perspective today on House File 66, which would establish a legislative commission on cybersecurity. As CISO, my role is to secure the state's IT infrastructure. Securing the state's system ensures Minnesotans in your district can buy their hunting or fishing license, purchase health insurance, or check travel conditions online during a winter storm. As Representative Bonner shared, this legislation is a culmination of significant conversation in the Governor's Blue Ribbon Council on Information Technology, specifically its Cybersecurity Subcommittee. The culmination of this input from industry experts resulted in the recommendation from the Blue Ribbon Council that the legislature create a venue which focused discussions regarding cybersecurity measures can occur. Minute welcomes the opportunity for a venue to share information and participate in discussions about the evolving risk in the cyber arena and how we coordinate and collaborate to best mitigate those risks. The cyber threat landscape is constantly evolving and adversaries are increasing their capabilities. The means and motivations of the adversaries range from hacktivism to organized crime rings. There is also the presence of nation state actors that want to build an offensive advantage or perform cyber espionage. Minute continues to make progress in improving the state's defensive cybersecurity posture. Some recent examples from last year include the 100% adoption of multi-factor authentication to support remote working, enhanced capabilities to defend against DDoS threats like those that targeted state government during the civil unrest, enhanced monitoring and detection capabilities of our networks to protect the 2020 election cycle. These threats target both the public and private sector of Minnesota, and the consequences of the cyber attack can have severe impacts to critical businesses and resources for Minnesotans. It is essential that organizational leadership have appropriate level of cyber risk oversight to keep pace with the changing needs. In the private sector, cybersecurity oversight continues to top the list of boardroom priorities. The organizational leader responsible for the cybersecurity program, leaders such as the CEO, CIOs, and roles similar to my own, Chief Information Security Officer, regularly strategize with designated leaders to outline the cybersecurity strategy and progress on key drivers of cyber maturity. This proactive engagement ensures board members can serve as external advisors and bring industry knowledge and best practices to benefit the CISO and ensure alignment of security and risk mitigation practices across all aspects of the organization. At the same time, the CISO is able to present progress reports and share barriers transparently without exposing vulnerabilities to external entities. The Legislative Commission on Cybersecurity can provide Minnesota cybersecurity oversight and support Minute services to keep pace with the changing threat landscape and be a conduit for the legislature to maintain alignment across other statewide needs. A few key areas where the LCC will benefit Minnesota include, first, empower a statewide approach to cybersecurity 
as an enterprise-wide risk management issue, not just an IT issue. Second, understand the cyber risk alignment to regulatory requirements on privacy and future recommendations for Minnesota. Third, support state IT leadership with adequate access to cybersecurity expertise and discussions about cyber risk management. Fourth, identifying staff and budget challenges for statewide cyber risk management framework and assist IT leadership to set expectations. And finally, gain visibility into key cybersecurity risks and security incidents, along with supporting data to align mitigation strategies and investment opportunities. The legislative investment in 2019 allowed Minute to focus on top cybersecurity priorities to make substantive progress in our security strategy. Continued partnership between the legislator and cybersecurity leaders can help to elevate the cybersecurity posture of the state and also help to ensure continued availability and integrity of the systems that Minnesotans rely on. Thank you for the opportunity to share this perspective. I will remain available should members have questions. Thank you for your testimony. The next person I have on my list is uh, Mr. Rick King, um, who's the chair of the, uh, of the Blue Ribbon Council. Mr. King, please state your name for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Rick King. I'm the chair of the Governor's Blue Ribbon Council on IT. Um, also serve in other capacities, and I'm the recently retired CIO, CTO from Thomson Reuters in Egan. It's a pleasure to be here to talk to you a little bit about House File 66, which uh, is a recommendation from the Blue Ribbon Council on IT uh, delivered in our June 2020 report. To say it simply, this collection of people from the private sector, from state agencies, from the counties, and our legislative bodies uh, recommends this as a great step forward, as indicated by our CISO. I would just say simply that our state needs a way to sit down and conf confidentially brief the legislative body on the issues associated with cyber attacks and defense. There is no mechanism to do that out of the view of public. And the problem with the public view is that the nefarious operators are out there listening to anything that's in the public and will use the information that they glean from that to attack. What we want to do is be able to fully brief legislative members in a confidential manner, which is aligned with what House File 66 suggests. On this committee, uh, you're really benefited by having two members who are on the Blue Ribbon Council for IT, uh, Representative Bonner, who is sponsoring this legislation, and also Representative Nash, both of whom have spent tireless hours working with our council, and we are greatly appreciative. Uh, you should know that this legislation is fully supported by the Blue Ribbon Council and IT, and I will stand for any questions that you might have uh, for me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, the questions, um, before we go to questions, uh, Ms. Roberts, uh, there's a fiscal note. Can you explain the fiscal note for us? And um, then we can go to questions. Ms. Roberts. Sure. Um, Mr. Chair, you have a fiscal note completed by the Legislative Coordinating Commission. Um, the chart on the front page of the fiscal note shows a cost of $10,000 per year, and that would be for the member cost for the commission for per diem and travel, et cetera. Um, within the note, if you look on page four, there's a discussion of a higher end estimate. Um, that would include if um, the legislature decided to hire a dedicated staff person within the LCC, and that cost would be approximately $180,000 per year for the salary and associated costs plus the member costs. So it would be up to the committee to decide at what level you would want to staff the commission. Thank you, Ms. Roberts. And with that member questions, I have uh, I see Representative Nash is on, on the list. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you to the folks who came in to testify. Yes, this is uh, a recommendation from the Blue Ribbon Council. Um, wish I would have been alerted to the bill, I would have signed on quite possibly, uh, wasn't afforded that courtesy, but uh, this is something that's important, uh, important enough that 
four years ago. This was actually my bill. Uh, I do support the the effort uh, and would like to, in in reference to Ms. Roberts' uh, commentary just now, recommend that we, uh, at least in the beginning, remember that we are looking at a massive deficit and that we uh, do not staff it fully, that we can uh, go with the, the lower cost option uh, just to be responsible and prudent, but still have the, the bones of what it is that we're looking for. Um, thanks to uh, Rohit and uh, to Chair King for coming in today to talk about this. But uh, I, I, I do want to again stress that we need to be thoughtful about how we're spending money since uh, we are looking at a challenge <clears throat> and that uh, we really do need this, but we can do it a little more cost effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Nash and members. That is one of the um, doing everything virtually this year in the legislature. We're not at the state office building able to pa uh, walk bills around to members and ask for signatures, but we do have the ability to sign on afterwards with the author um, piece. And so, um, any other questions? Representative Bonner, I see you got your finger up. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, I want to say thank you. And first, I do want to thank Representative Nash. Um, some of you may know that this is sort of an area of expertise for Representative Nash, um, and he's been an invaluable part of this conversation. And and just so you know, I, I want to apologize to you personally, Mr. Representative Nash. Um, I did actually send an invitation for you to sign on. It should be in your inbox. Um, unfortunately, I was down for the count for with a stomach bug for a few days, so it, it got a little bit waylaid, but um, but it should be in your inbox. And, and I certainly hope to have your support, um, as I know that you have vast expertise in this area. Um, in terms of the cost, I, I would like to echo um, what Representative Nash has said. I think, especially as IT professionals, we can be responsible. And I think that it, the net, that having some an additional staff person at, mo at the moment is probably not likely or needed. Um, and, and I do think that based on the, even the small appropriation that we have, um, I think we have this beautiful thing called technology these days, um, which could certainly be used to help cut down on expenses for things like travel or lodging. Um, certainly, we want that available for our members who may be out in greater Minnesota if they need to congregate together with us all. Uh, but we know technology can often uh, dispel the need for some of those expenses. And as legislators, we know the budget better than anyone. So if we don't use the, the small placeholder that we have, certainly I have no doubt that we would be more than happy to return that money to the general fund. Thank you for that, Representative Bonner. Um, members, any, any other members have questions? Give it a couple seconds here. Quiet bunch this morning. Um, if not, members, we'll, we're gonna lay this over for, for possible inclusion in our uh, omnibus bill going forward. So with that, thank you, Representative Bonner, and thank you, Mr. King and Mr. Um, Mohit. And, uh, um, for your for your time and your expertise. Sure. Thank you, members. Um, with that, we're going to lay this bill over. Um, the next item on our agenda today is House File seventy two, Representative Freiberg's bill, um, and I will move that House File seventy two be held over for possible inclusion and then. In, a, in the um, omnibus bill. Um, Representative Freiberg, are you, are you here if you wanna start explaining your bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's uh, good to be back in the State Government Finance Committee. Um, so this is an issue that I started caring about when my kids were very little and we were sleep training them. So, so we'd finally get to a point where they were sleeping for a few hours and waking up at a reasonable time and then the clocks would change for no particular reason and our schedule would get all screwed up. Now, this may not seem like the biggest issue in the world, but when you have a colicky baby and are completely exhausted, it was extremely frustrating. Uh, studies have shown that these clock changes are bad for people's health and safety, so I became interested in getting rid of the clock changes. So assuming I was going to introduce a bill to do that, I had a choice to make. Should I move to permanent standard time, which is currently allowed under federal law and would mean that there would be an extra hour of morning sunlight in the winter, but less evening sunlight in the summer? 
or should I move to permanent daylight saving time, also called advanced standard time, which is not yet allowed by federal law, but has already been passed in one state and has bills pending in several others. Now, doing, doing this would mean that we would keep the extra evening sunlight in the summer. Um, ultimately, I decided to try the permanent daylight saving time approach. There are definitely people who support both options, and I believe you will hear from a person who supports the opposite approach today. Um, but a few things led me to ultimately decide on this approach. So first of all, um, I haven't done a conclusive survey, but I think uh, more people prefer it. A lot of people really like that extra evening sunlight in the summer for recreation activities and other purposes. Second, studies do suggest that this approach has several benefits. In your member packets, you should have an article that shows several benefits of permanent daylight saving time and site sources to support it. Now, I won't read the whole article to you, um, but the benefits identified include improved traffic safety, a decrease in crime, energy savings, and increased opportunities for recreation and commerce. This bill has bipartisan support, um, and the approach to wait for federal law to change has the benefit of giving Minnesota businesses and residents time to adjust to the change rather than making it suddenly. Um, I think a few people are here to testify on the bill, and I welcome your questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Freiberg. With that, I have a list of testifiers here. The first person on my list, and um, again, forgive me if I mangle your name, Latita um, Moreau. Leticia, it means joy. Leticia. It means joy in Latin. It's a Latin word. Thank you. Well, like I said, I apologize for for um, for mangling. Proceed with. Uh, please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, I had slides that I've sent. I don't know if the people can see it, but uh, please follow them uh, along. If I cannot share them, so. Uh, my name is Leticia Moho, and I'm honored to, to testify against HF72. Uh, thanks to my husband also to, who puts up with me following this subject in testifying. Uh, thank you to the Minnesota legislature for giving me the opportunity to just to testify. Thanks for listening and helping to prevent a hurtful bill to pass. I named the HF72, a bill, a dark morning's bill. Maybe you could help to replace it with a great opportunity for health and climate, a bill with permanent natural standard time. The bill HF really could be called dark morning's bill. This meeting started at about 8.15 a.m. and was in daylight. It would have been in the dark with this bill. Uh, sunrise was at 7.26, it would, it would be at 8.26 with this bill. Uh, imagine DST is like building a road and that people have to cross twice every year. HF72 is like stopping people in the middle of the road and the traffic. Um, many Americans dislike time changes crossing the road. A majority prefer standard time, and there are polls that show that that maybe uh, haven't seen, been seen. And standard time is a natural standard time when everybody's at maximum 30 minutes of solar time. And some Americans might buy into HF72. Perma DST at first, but science and history, 1974 in particular, that the authors didn't mention, uh, was an egregious failure that showed that uh, they will probably hate DST in the winter, and and um, because HF is a very unnatural and harmful way of addressing the the problem of time changes, and rather than taking the hands of it, the problem man-made, it further is an overreach and a creator of inequity. And it would increase the number of dark mornings and also require a change in federal law. St. Paul would have 88 days a year when the third rises after 8.15 a.m., and Fergus Fall would have 110. This number increases as you go west because the sun goes from east to west. There is a better way to get rid of time change. Simply restore natural standard time year round. Everybody within 30 minutes of solar time, that is Minnesota's current standard time. Doing so, zero days of sunrises after 8.15. This is allowed by the federal law and could be done even this very March. And so, HF is a nefarious bill, and why is it even considered? Some lobby hard for it. I quote the chairman of the National Association of Advanced Convents, 
uh, and fewer retailing in, in 2010. Third, in the in 80s and then again in the 90s, NSES helped move up the debt -like saving time. At the time, it was estimated it would have one billion in sales every year for the industry. That's tens of billions of dollars. Uh, since. You will hear claims of benefits and people will omit to mention the history of 1974 and they will not pull comprehensive numbers. They will cherry pick interesting studies for them. Whatever benefits they, they're claiming, they are either false or they are uh, or they pale in front of the public interest. Many studies have, uh, are cherry picked, uh, modelized, and not real experience with the controlled population. America has a long history of about messing with clocks, and recently there's been a blitz apparently under Florida's leadership. Tens of states' legislature have been assaulted and rushed with similar bills. You can be proud of Minnesota because it has resisted since 2019. And a state like Washington has, has been fooled. And it's California is not done. It is wrong to say that it is on board. Last time I heard the PEMA DC, DST had not been passed. The uh, Energy Committee uh, in the Senate, it's been a year, it's been like not uh, oh, oh, afraid of trying to pass. And I heard also from a lawmaker in Wyoming, the Wyoming that passed the PEMA DST last year, and it's writing a new bill to undo the error. I mentioned 1974, it's quite important and not mentioned by the authors, and there is an egregious precedent of permanent advance time. So this is DST in the winter, that was done in 1974 under Nixon, and it was a disaster and it had to be rescinded within months. And people were hungry, the kids, uh, kids were killed on, and uh, uh, on the way to picture on the on the way to school in the dark and waiting in lines in the bus for the bus. You will hear that DST sells energy and that's a misrepresentation in the summer and in the winter that's even worse. Comprehensive studies, for example, in Indiana show that the heat the, the bills actually uh, home bills go by one percent, a significant one percent. And if in the winter, it could be 4% increase in, in heating bills. That's a Yale MIT study of 2008, widely shared and bizarrely not shared by the author. And uh, a full comprehensive study also must include the gas consumption. You've heard the NACS uh, uh, people saying they were happy to sell more fuel. So DST probably does not save. It should be called DST, daylight saving time. That's a seasonal future, and it will be worse in the winter in terms of heating, and certainly in Minnesota and probably in Florida. The bill is harmful to, to people to be public, while well, you can go go natural times 365, the other choice that would be an opportunity. H74 is 72 is not permitted by federal law. Uh, natural time is permitted. Many damages created by seasonal DST will not go away as time changes go away, but, in, but it will be increased if DST uh, with DST in the winter. Um, please stop HF72, a dark morning's bill, transform it into natural time 375. Uh, it would be good for kids' safety, for sleep, immunity, ingenuity, mental health, life, uh, less disease, less cancer, smaller home bills, less carbon emission. It uh, would be good for public health and climate. It could be put in place in March, and you could even protect the immunity against COVID-19. And, uh, you know, this is not a personal opinion, and this is, there are numbers also, there are, this is a consensual opinion by science, equity, history, uh. and, uh, and uh, it's a challenge to cover in a few minutes. Please check my sources attached in the documents and come back to me for questions if you need. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Monroe. Um, the next person I have on the list, testifiers, is a Jeff Cole. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, hello, good morning, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, testify this morning. My name is Jeff Kolb. I'm going to apologize in advance. We are having construction done on the house, so I assume that the sawing and uh, hammering will, uh, it's been quiet so far, but I'm sure it's going to start right now. Uh, as, as a retired carpenter, that's music to my ears. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Cole. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're hanging cabinets today, so that's right up right up your alley. Um, 
uh, I don't have anything about anybody dying uh, or anything like that uh, in my testimony. I, I'm going to tell a quick story and then um, and then uh, just share a couple of opinions here. Uh, we're going to flash way back to the year 2006 when I was much younger and uh, working at the state fair for uh, former Governor Tim Pawlenty as he was uh, trying to uh, get, be reelected there in 2006, and a woman approached and said, "What's the governor's stance on daylight savings time?" And uh, the people I was with uh, looked at each other, and we kind of shrugged and said, um, I, I, "I don't know, man. Uh, he, he's for it. I, I, I don't know." <laughs> and she went on to this this whole thing about how terrible daylight savings time was, and she only votes for people who uh, are opposed to daylight savings time, and she gave us an earful and uh, she went on her merry way and uh, enjoyed her uh, her uh, bucket of donuts that she was eating. And we kind of made some, some jokes after she left. And then flash forward to a few years ago, uh, it's a different world. And here I am nagging uh, poor Mike Freiberg, uh, telling him he's got to introduce a bill to get rid of daylight savings time because I hate the clock change. Uh, what happened in the meantime was um, I had kids, and so I like to say that I, I, I'd like to say that I'm here representing beleaguered parents everywhere. And I think Mike kind of mentioned this, or Representative Freiberg mentioned this in his intro. Uh, kids are kids are all about routines, right? And uh, I've got two kids. There's a seven year old and a four year old just turned four. Um, you just get them sleeping, you just get them ready, and then suddenly somebody changes the clock on you and it's mass chaos again. Um, you, you've got in your packet, I believe, and you've heard all of the, the arguments about why we should not change the clocks and why it's dangerous and why it causes problems. Um, I'm just asking for some relief as a parent of small children uh, and, and somebody who you know has kind of enough to deal with anyway. Um, let's remove this one little thing from uh, one little burden and uh, just keep the clocks where they are. I don't have a strong opinion on which time you, you pick. Don't care. Uh, let's just leave. pick one, leave the clocks there. I will say I lived in Arizona for a few years. We didn't move our clocks. It was fantastic. I loved it. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, um, the next person I have on my list is uh, Mike Hickey. And if you want to identify yourself for the record and, and then proceed with your testimony. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mike Hickey just appearing as a citizen today. And uh, really appreciate Representative Freiberg uh, authoring this bill again. Uh, I think I showed up two years ago to uh, just uh, voice some support for this. So I'm glad we're, we're back to this point. The bill has passed out of committee in the Senate, we may find a bipartisan moment on this bill uh, this year, with all the other things we got to deal with. But uh, it's appropriate, we're having this hearing right now, we're kind of coming out of our three months of very short days, or what I think of as our dark period. And uh, I've, looked, I've, I've looked too deep into this, Mr. Chairman, and maybe I shouldn't. I always thought our shortest day of the year from a sunset perspective was possibly a day or two. Well, I took a hard look at it. In 2019, we had 50, we had 10 days of a, of a 431 sunset in 2019. So it's not one or two days, it's 10. It seems bad, it seems like you're driving home in the dark. It seems like you're, the only light you really get is on the weekend if you have to work. And it is that bad, it's 10 days. And so if this bill would to pass, it would be 531 basically said, you know, what happened in uh, 2019, 2019, it'd be 531 would be our shortest day of the year with a little glimmer of sun, dusk till six. What a difference. What a dramatic difference. And that's about what we're experiencing right now, uh, kind of coming out of our very dark phase. But for people who are athletic, such as myself, uh, want to get out there and uh, try to run in this weather, cross country, ski, do other types of recreation, or simply just walk your dog. Wouldn't it be nice to uh, have more daylight uh, every day and to have the vast, vast majority of days to have light beyond six and our shortest day of the year 
at about six. I think it would make a huge difference to a lot of people's lives. And I sure appreciate Representative Freiberg continuing to advocate for this. I took a quick look while the hearing was going on. There are 13 states that have gone to this. Of course, it's triggered by a federal law change. And who knows, it might be a, a rare bipartisan moment in Washington, too, that uh, they could get together on this. So anyways, I just want to urge you to support this. I really think it would make a huge difference in a lot of people's lives. Thank you, Mr. Hickey. Um, with that, members, um, are there any questions of the testifiers or of the uh, representative uh, Freiberg? And I guess I'll, I have one question, uh, Mr. Representative Freiberg. I know we've had that we've had this before and we passed it out, but why the difference between? I know, I know you said it's it's you could go either way with this, and I understand that if we wanted to go with standard time, we would not have we could do that immediately. We would not have to wait for uh, Congress to pass a law. Um, so, what was, what was your reasoning behind picking the daylight savings time? Sure, thank you for the question. Uh, personally, I don't really have a preference. I kind of agree with my constituent, Mr. Kolb, on this one, actually. Um, I just, my main interest is getting rid of the clock changes. However, um, I have, in the past, I signed on to a bill to go on to permanent daylight saving time, and I heard, or I'm sorry, permanent standard time. And I did hear from quite a few people about that who really appreciate that extra hour of evening sunlight in the summer. Um, I do know, I mean, I do, you know, like I showed you some study I, I, in your member packets, there's a, there's also an article uh, that shows some of the benefits related to crime and the economy and so forth of the, of the permanent daylight saving time approach, as opposed to the permanent standard time approach. Um, so, you know, just for me, it was the combination of hearing from people um, and the research that I've done on this. Uh, sure, I, I know there are some studies out there um, pointing the other way as well. Um, in my opinion, it's slightly the the one on the side of the bill I introduced it somewhat outweighs the the other side. Um, um, but um, just generally, the the research I've done, the sense I have is that the people support the permanent daylight saving time approach. Um, and I do honestly think um, making the switch immediately could potentially be more disruptive as well. And this way, we um, we we do prepare uh, businesses and residents for the change by waiting for the federal government to make the change. And I, I do think also this is the trend in other states. And we will be, by doing the approach that I'm suggesting here, we will be consistent with uh, with what's going on in other states. I think Mr. Hickey mentioned that 13 states have already um, looked into this. So, and I know there's lots of bills around the country. I think the National Conference on State Legislatures actually has a, has a graphic showing which states have introduced bills. And I think most of them are uh, following this approach. Well, I have question. I have a list of questioners now. Uh, Representative Bonner. Um, you're first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and Representative Freiberg. Um, my understanding is that there may be some data out there around. We've talked a little bit about the safety issue uh, in the evening in terms of uh, the evening commute, as well as um, children and, and their safety out and about um, in those evening hours. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more to uh, that particular issue. Um, and if there's studies or information out there about the safety and efficacy of having that in the evening versus the morning? Yeah. The, Representative the, Freiberg. Sorry, Mr. Chair, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I know. It's, <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I'd be used to it by now. Um, uh, the, and the article in your packets, I guess I'd just point you to that. Uh, the number two item there um, says that by having a permanent daylight saving time approach, crime would decrease. Um, it says darkness is a friend of crime. Moving sunlight into the evening hours has far greater impact on the prevention of crime than it does in the morning. This is especially true for crimes by juveniles, which peak in the after school and early evening hours. Uh, criminals strongly prefer to do their work in the darkness of evening and night. Crime rates are lower by 30% in the morning to afternoon hours, even when those morning hours occur before sunrise when it's still dark. A 2013 British study found that improved lighting in the evening hours could reduce the crime rate by up to 20%. So... Um, you know, I, that to me was fairly compelling. Um, I guess maybe I'll just leave it at that. Representative Bonner. You're muted, Representative Bonner. 
Thank you, Representative Freiberg. Um, also, there was a point about, um, we talked about the school bus and the kids and all that, um, but my understanding is um, by moving to this system, that means that when they're getting home in the evening, there would be more light and when they're out playing and things like that. And and my understanding is that there may be some additional um, safety uh, gains here in that there may be less uh, children at risk in the evening um, in terms of that the number of uh, accidents goes down in the evening um, for children. It, can you speak to that or is that accurate? Uh, Freiburg. Sure. Well, the reason I included that particular article um, in your packets is because it touches on a lot of these topics that get raised. Um, and it points out that the evening rush hour is twice as fatal as the morning for various reasons. Far more people are on the road, more alcohol is in driver's bloodstreams. People are hurrying to get home and more children are enjoying outdoor unsupervised play. Um, DST brings an extra hour of sunlight into the evening to mitigate those risks. Standard time has precisely the opposite impact by moving sunlight into the morning. I mean, essentially by picking one approach over the other, I mean, you, you do have a choice to make. It's like, do you prefer the sunlight in the morning or the evening? And um, I, my sense is it's it's generally safer and more people prefer the, e the evening sunlight approach. Representative Mason, Luvati, your question. Well, it's just... You're muted again. What concerned me was the comments about school because I, the kids, next, I have a bus stop right next door. So it really bothers me during the winter when I see the kids standing out waiting for the bus in the dark. And I mean, it, it's going to happen regardless. But my thought is if we do the daylight savings time, it means more times that they're out in the morning. And so, so I guess my thought that 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 is my main concern is is a safety issue. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Mason. Uh, the next person on my list is Representative Greenman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, uh, 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 Representative Freiberg. Um, I just it, I really enjoyed this conversation um, and uh, uh, really appreciate. Uh, as, a, as somebody who is more of a night owl, um, I will definitely say really appreciate the idea of having uh, um, a little extra time at night. And, and the conversation about schools, you know, when I went to uh, South High School, uh, we went to school when it was dark um, uh, under daylight savings time um, um, or under the time shift. And then uh, if you played sports or whatever, you left and it was dark and didn't have a lot of windows and so never saw the day, light of day in the winter. And the idea of having um, a sunlight until six, um, having a, an hour or so getting home uh, with, uh, with sun uh, is, I think, would have had a huge impact on, on us. And I can imagine having an impact on, on school kids. I will also say in this pandemic, I don't know if folks have been walking more, um, but when, we, when the time shifted and suddenly it started getting dark much earlier, it sort of took that uh, hour away of sort of after the Zoom meetings ended, um, to be able to go outside um, and take a breath of fresh air. So I would have, uh, I would love this now, um, but really appreciate you bringing it in. Appreciate the bipartisan support. Thank you. Next person on my list is Representative Griskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Freiberg, for uh, bringing the bill. Um, you know, contrary to some of the arguments around this very interesting topic, uh, members, they still only make 24 hours in every day. I think the uh, the value to this, uh, Representative Freiberg, I agree with you 100%, is just to eliminate the disruption. Um, for me, I would want, the only thing I would wonder in, in picking one, as you pointed out, uh, is what are the states directly around us doing? I think that is probably our biggest impact or biggest, uh, at least for me, uh, the biggest decision point. Uh, Representative uh, Freiberg. Yeah, um, I don't believe any of them have adopted this yet. I think there might be bills introduced in at least one of them, but I would need to probably double check the uh, National Conference of State Legislatures website again and find that page. I can get that information for you, Representative Driskowski. I do think it's a good question. I do think we're um, 
in a better situation than some states as far as this is concerned because we don't have any uh, time zone boundaries in Minnesota. We're all within one time zone. So, uh, so this change would be uniform across the state. Ms. Moreau, I see you have your hand up uh, quickly. Quick answer. Do you have something yeah. to add to it? Yeah, I would like to uh, thank you for mentioning that uh, the standard time, current standard time could be kept right now without change to federal uh, bill uh, law. So why, why wait? And uh, I would uh, ask why uh, is Mr. Freiberger not talking about 1974? History tells there's been the experience has been terrible. And I would also urge everybody to not rely on their personal experience uh, too much because it's very uh, confusing. And this is why there are studies and scientific uh, evaluations of the impact. And also do, think about the people of the West. They are much worse. Uh, Fergus Paul versus St. Paul. And uh, you, you, you have to act for the public good, not for your personal interest. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Representative Skalski, do you have any more questions? No, that pretty well does it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And thank you, Representative Freiberg. Thank you. I see no more hands up. Uh, Representative Freiberg, if you want to wrap up, and then we can lay this over for possible inclusion. Representative Freiberg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I appreciate the discussion. Certainly appreciate uh, Ms. Moreau's passion on this issue. Um, you know, like I said, I my my big goal in this is getting rid of the time changes based on the input I've received from Minnesotans, um, as well as the research I've done. I think the permanent uh, daylight saving time approach is the is the preferable one. So, really appreciate you uh, giving this bill some consideration, and I uh, will leave it at that. Thank you, Representative Freiberg. And with that, members, I'll lay this bill over for possible inclusion. Um, and thank you, Representative Freiberg. And thank you, testifiers, for your time. Um, the next bill we have on our list is House File 35 and Representative Elkins. And Representative Elkins, have you uh, solved your microphone problems? Oh, I just, because of the snow, I was uh, two minutes late to the to the meeting, so. Oh, I, I had, there was a scroll there, that I, a text I had that you had problems with the microphone. No, anyway. no, we, we had some confusion uh, with uh, some of the stakeholders over the, uh, whether the uh, amendment uh, had been properly posted, and we have established that, in fact, it was, and it's there, and so uh, we're all squared away to proceed. So, Representative Elkins, if you want to move your bill, um, Yep. So, uh, Madam, Mr. Chair, we will be, um, um, because the Minnesota Council on Disabilities is actually under the financial jurisdiction of the Human Services Committee, we will be, uh, the move, a motion uh, will be to uh, uh, hear this bill and recommend approval to have it moved to the uh, Human Services Finance and Policy Committee. Representative Elkins moves that House File 35 um, be referred to the Committee on Health and Human Services. Um, yep. And Representative Elkins, I understand you have an amendment. We have an author's amendment. This author's amendment, um, you know, the, the grants would be administered by the Minnesota Council on Disabilities. And this amendment, uh, the A3 amendment, will uh, add an advisory committee uh, to the Minnesota Council on Disabilities with representatives from local government, uh, Minute, uh, and the uh, stakeholder community uh, self-advocate uh, as to that, uh, to the process as, as well. So um, I move the approval of the A3 amendment. Uh, Representative Elkins moves the A3 amendment, and this is an author's amendment. So all the, uh, members, all those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And then the amendment has been put on. Representative Elkins, you want to explain the bill as it's amended? I will. So I have a uh, short PowerPoint and uh, doing this, doing it this way for two reasons. Oh, one second, Representative Elkins. We also need to, because this came from Health and Human Services, or for, excuse oh. me, came from local government, we have to move the, uh, the um, local government division report. If you want to do that, Representative Elkins. Uh, so moved, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, we move the, uh, the, the division report for house from local the local government for House File 35. Again, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? And uh, now that it not is officially before us, Representative Elkins, if you want to move your amendment, um, again, House, um, okay. house the A3 uh, amendment. Yes, Mr. Chair, I'll formally move the adoption of the A3 amendment. Uh, Representative Elkins moves the A3 amendment for House File 35. All in favor, say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. I'll now proceed with your with your um, presentation. Your, uh, <laughs> presentation. Presentation. Thank you. I couldn't find the word in my brain. Okay. Go ahead. Basically, the bill establishes a, a grant program to provide uh, funding for small cities and counties to help them make their websites more uh, accessible to people with disabilities in accordance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. The grant program would be administered by the Minnesota Council on Disabilities with the assistance of the uh, advisory committee that we just uh, added to the bill. The League of Minnesota Cities and the Association of Minnesota Counties are working with the Minnesota Council on Disabilities and the Minute Office of Accessibility to provide training and support for this initiative. The $1 million is requested as a placeholder. The final amount would depend on the Human Services Finance Committee's budget target. Uh, the bill is supported by the Minnesota Council on Disabilities, the Association of Minnesota Counties, the League of Minnesota Cities, and the Minnesota Association of Small Cities. Uh, and today we are uh, testifying, hopefully if, if Noah is here, and I understand that he is not here, uh, most of us know Noah, he would be testifying. Uh, but I, I, last time I, we checked in, I don't think Noah had shown up yet. So I think the only testifier is going to be Dave Dively of the uh, Minnesota Council on Disabilities. Um, Irene Cow from the League of Minnesota Cities and Leah Patton from the Association of Minnesota Counties are here to answer questions as well. Okay, um, Mr. Dively, if you want to introduce yourself for the record and you can proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is David Dively and I'm the Executive Director for the Minnesota Council on Disabilities here to speak in favor of House File 35. We want to ensure that uh, not only are local cities and counties able to have functioning effective websites for digital communication and government efficacy, but also that the same services and abilities uh, to have kind of this crucial information, particularly in a pandemic time, to be accessible for all Minnesotans, especially Minnesotans with disabilities. We will be hosting a committee of various stakeholders to ensure that city, uh, city county and IT representation is there for the grant making process and ensure that the awardees represent a geographic diversity across the state. Remediating websites for accessibility is not a one size fits all approach. And while there are best practices that the Minute Office of Accessibility has created, the practice of actually modifying websites for that accessibility criteria is different in each city, county and website. Uh, it's crucial, lastly, as well to say that uh, for all citizens uh, to be able to work with their local units of government and local units of government are under tremendous budget constraints at the moment. And this grant would help some to improve their access and reduce their legal liability while improving access for all Minnesotans. Like with physical curb cuts, website accessibility improves usability for all people, not just Minnesotans with disabilities. And I'll stand by for any questions. Thank you to the committee and Representative Elkins. Thank you there. And members, are there any questions? Um, Give it a couple seconds here. Representative Nash, I see you put your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Representative Elkins, uh, just putting my, my former mayor's hat back on, why are we uh, funding something at the state that cities could be levying for themselves uh, locally in counties and whomever else would like to take advantage of this? And then if I remember correctly, your initial request was much smaller than this uh, financially. So if you wouldn't mind explaining those things for us. Sure, so the-, Repres the Representative Elkins. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Nash. So the, this this uh, program is kind of geared for, for smaller cities that just don't have the, uh, the, the resources to tackle this themselves. Um, larger cities and counties aren't really having that much of a problem maintaining the accessibility of, the, of their websites. Um, you know, the uh, League of Minnesota Cities and the counties are, are doing a good job, I think, generally of, of leveraging uh, the uh, uh, resources that the uh, Minute Office of Accessibility has uh, provided uh, to assist their, uh, their, their member cities and counties to, uh, uh, to, to maintain their um, their, their websites in a digitally accessible manner. Uh, but it's just, it, it is, you know, there, there is no magic button to push. Uh, it, it requires, um, you know, a conscientious effort to, uh, um, in, in the creation of both websites and documents to uh, ensure that they uh, are web, uh, web accessible or just 
generally accessible. Um, and I am learning that firsthand that the presentation, the, the PowerPoint that I'm using today um, is the very first instance of a, uh, a use of a, uh, a, an accessible PowerPoint template that was created by Elaine Settergren in the, uh, the reference library, who was uh, our, our liaison to uh, the, um, uh, the, the Minute Office of Accessibility and uh, other members of the LCC staff, Michelle Weber and others on her team are also been very instrumental in um, making sure that training is available to our staff and rep, rep, um, as well as uh, resources like this, uh, this digital um, a PowerPoint template, but it's a lot of work. And in order to complete this uh, um, uh, well and keep it accessible, um, I had to follow a five-page uh, guideline document on how to use this template. So it's just, it's just, um, it, it takes a lot of conscientious work to keep both documents and websites accessible. And most small cities and counties just don't have the resources. So I, we would expect that uh, the initial grants. Um, you know, will be used to create uh, exemplar programs that uh, that other small cities and, and counties can use as, as a model. And as I stated at the beginning, the $1 million is just a, a placeholder and the final amount uh, will be determined depending on the, the budget targets that the, uh, the chair of the Human Services Committee receives as part of the budgeting process. But there's a feeling among the, uh, the cities and counties that uh, uh, up to a million dollars could be productively used in this manner. And members, I might have um, I might have missed uh, Miss Patton or, or Miss Miss Turner, excuse me, Miss Patton or Miss Cow that were on my list. I think they were listed as to answer questions. Miss Patton, did you want to testify, or do, are you just here to answer questions? Hi, Mr. Chair. Um, I can answer questions. I'm fine to do that because this kind of follows along with what I was going to say anyways <laughs> in terms of context. Um, it's good to see so many familiar faces today. Um, so in terms of context and um, my testimony... Can you please identify yourself for the, yes. hey, for the record, okay. please? Um, my name is Leah Patton. I'm with the Association of Minnesota Counties and its daughter association, the Minnesota County um, IT Leadership Association. And I also have a little bit of context for the League of Minnesota Cities as well, but Irene from the League is also on the call here if she wants to answer specifically for cities. So um, as Representative Elkins mentioned, um, we do think this is a grant program that will specifically benefit uh, small cities and small counties. And we're really um, excited and grateful that Representative Elkins and the advocate, uh, advocates have included us in this discussion because we agree it is an issue that needs to be addressed promptly. Um, we, th I think it's important to note that a lot of smaller cities and small counties rely on vendors to build their, their websites. They're not building them in-house. They don't have um, staff with that kind of expertise or, or the man hours to do that in-house, um, which has its benefits, but there's also a disadvantage to that because um, it requires training for staff to be able to spot check their websites and make sure that what the vendor is providing them which is supposed to be accessible up to a government standard, which is higher than the private industry standard for accessibility, um, you need to be able to spot check and make sure that it is actually accessible. So you can verify that your vendor is actually providing you what they've contracted for and to, to keep them accountable on that. Um, and along the same lines, I think it's important to note that this is a pretty big mountain to climb. Honestly, if your website hasn't been accessible up to this point, either in terms of the content that you're uploading on a daily basis, your forms, your videos, anything that actually gets uploaded to the website has to be accessible as well. So even if the structure of the website is accessible, it can become inaccessible very, very quickly. If you have um, staff that aren't trained in how to make accessible forms, how to go through and do closed captioning, that sort of thing, um, it can get out of control pretty quickly, even if your website is accessible. So we think that um, coupled with training that we have done and continue to do um, with the uh, Office of Accessibility at Minute and the Minnesota Council, um, we think that right now, especially with COVID, more and more content is going on these websites. So the issue is getting bigger and bigger. So we see this grant program as a good start to get everything that exists into line, get training for staff and, and move forward with accessible websites um, and, and 
a community of IT professionals that know what they're doing and how to do it on their on their website specifically. So um, if you guys have any additional questions, please let me know. But otherwise, uh, that's that's my answer to that question, I guess. So. And Representative Nash, I apologize for breaking into your question, line of questioning, but I had, for, I had missed her and I just yeah. wanted to make sure that I had uh, I didn't, uh, we got our testimony if that's what you wanted to do. Representative Abs Nash. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, having been in the chair of a city council member and a mayor, as I know others have, uh, this should be a priority of municipalities and counties and such. And I, I certainly do understand some of the restrictions and, and difficulties, but uh, the state's going to see similar difficulties from a budgetary perspective. You know, uh, Chair Nelson, we haven't seen a, a forecast yet, nor have we received targets. Um, and while we can say, well, it's just a million dollars, uh, which may, which a representative uh, may bring forward, but I, I just, I would prefer to see cities, counties, townships, and so on uh, figure out how to do this on their own. Uh, I believe there's great value in in that. I do believe there's great value in making sure that everybody can access the webpage. It is important, but the state is going to be tackling a monstrous budget uh, battle and a million here, a million there, um, it eventually adds up. And this is not something that we can just flippantly do. So I. Again, I support the concept. I support the idea of, of making any citizen uh, fully capable of, of accessing the web page. But uh, we're, we're talking uh, pre-forecast, pre-budget um, numbers for, uh, for us and internally for targets. And uh, I just think that we need to show a little restraint. So thank you. And members, that's why we are moving this bill to HHS because this will be coming out of their budget, not our budget. So um, that's why we're hearing the bill. The way it was introduced, it would have been in our budget, but with the amendment, it becomes part of the HHS budget. And so we're moving it to them for them to consider it. Uh, the next person on my list is Representative Kosnick. Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And we, I remember hearing this bill um, last year in the local government division. And this bill seems to have grown in scope and cost. And I'm wondering if the author could speak to, I think last year we were talking about making it a one-time funding to uh, lay the groundwork for the cities and the local municipalities to kind of have that template. Um, could you talk about why the bill has grown in scope and cost? And as Representative Nash had mentioned, um, we're not in a budget situation. Um, and e even if we did have, uh, projected surpluses down the road, uh, we still need to be cognizant of the growth of government and at the state level. Um, and so if you could talk about the scope, uh, the growth and the in the scope of the bill, adding a, a whole council and why it's not one-time funding as was discussed before and the growth in the cost of the bill too. Thank you. Representative uh, Elkins. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair, Mr. Kosnick, uh, Representative Kosnick. Um, yeah, when the, the first version of the bill was uh, introduced, um, the uh, Council on Disabilities um, was not comfortable with the idea of administering the grant themselves, and so the responsibility would have fallen to the Department of Administration. And the uh, uh, Department of Administration is under the uh, budgeting uh, purview of this committee. But in the uh, intervening uh, year, um, the Minnesota Council on Disabilities has become comp uh, you know, more comfortable with the, with the idea of administering the grant themselves. They feel like they uh, have that capability now. Uh, and so that's the, the main change in the structure of the bill is the uh, transfer of the administrative responsibilities from the Department of Administration to the Council on Disabilities. And then in discussions with the, uh, the stakeholder local governments, uh, and, uh, and advocates, um, you know, it was a, agreed that it would be appropriate and, uh, and an assistance to the council to add an advisory committee consisting of local government uh, officials, uh, the uh, Minute Office of Accessibility and the uh, um, advocacy community. And in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, the budgeted amount, um, I would just wouldn't get hung up on that. I think the original amount was only like, uh, you know, $100,000 as a, a placeholder. And in talking with the cities and counties, it's like, oh no, the, the need is actually much greater than that. So again, the, the million dollars that's in the bill this year is just a placeholder. Uh, the uh, 
know, amount that uh, might and will, would be actually allocated to the program is going to depend on the budget target that the Human Services Committee uh, receives. So Representative Elkins, what you're saying is scalable then if they- It's, it's scalable. I mean, what, what the, basically the cities and counties have told us is that uh, they think that they could, uh, that, that the need is such that they could productively spend up to a million dollars. Representative Kosnick. Well, I appreciate the uh, response, Mr. Chair. And, you know, I, I just think we always need to be cognizant of the fact of um, growing our expenses and increasing our budgets. And, you know, it's kind of obvious uh, that that's the scope has just gotten larger and larger, uh, not to minimize uh, the need or the intent, but uh, those are things that we need to constantly be uh, cognizant of. And, um, as Representative Nash and others have said, uh, maybe the this should be something that's handled a little bit more and the shared among uh, the cities and, and the counties. So thank you uh, for bringing the bill forward, I guess. Representative New Brindley, you're next on my list. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just looking at the language of the bill and and frankly, as somebody, uh, my, my late husband actually used um, eye tracking technology um, to use computers and websites. And so I certainly am probably more aware than most of the need for accessibility in this realm. My, my question is, I, I'm wondering about the language on 2.17 and 2.18 to apply for, accept, and disperse grants and other aids from other public or private sources. This seems quite a, more expansive than it needs to be for this bill. Was there an intention for that, uh, Representative Elkins? Um, Representative Elkins. Thank you, Matt. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative uh, New Brindley. I'm going to defer that question to, uh, to Leah or Irene. Uh, Leah or Irene? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair and members, can you repeat the question, Representative Brindley? I'm sorry. I didn't see yes. which line you were referring to specifically here. That is okay. Let Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me just switch screens. Um, on 2.17 and 2.18, to apply for, accept, and disperse grants and other aids from other public or private sources. Um, it, it seems that that might be more expansive than it needs to be for this bill, and I'm wondering if there was a reason for that. Uh, Ms. Mr. Chair, members, thank you. Um, I don't recall, honestly, what part of that conversation was involved. Um, my understanding as you know, just representing counties here, was that it would be a specific grant allocation from the state of Minnesota. So if that's if that's mentioning other kind of private grant allocations that would go through the state, I'm not sure what that's referencing, if that's what that language is meant to be. Thank you. Mr. Representative Chair. New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Patton. Um, perhaps Representative Elkins, that is something we could consider as this moves forward, tightening up that language a little bit. Um, since it seems maybe unnecessary uh, for this program. But I, I like I said, I, I have pretty personal experience with this and, and, and appreciate the need for accessible websites. Yeah. yeah. Representative Chair, Chair. Um, is um, Ms. Gow, would, would, you, would you want to weigh on, on, in on this issue? I, I... Mr. Chair, members, my name is Irene Gow. I am from the League of Minnesota Cities. Um, so Ms. Gow, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative, for asking that question. Uh, that language was language we had worked with House Research, I believe, in terms of a way to provide authority to the Council on Disability to be able to uh, administer and distribute grants. But I agree with you, we could work on that language and tighten up and make sure that it still provides the necessary authority for the Council. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, next person on my list is Representative Greenman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, Representative uh, Elkins. I am, um, uh, I've heard a lot about this um, from constituents, uh, folks with disabilities, and also disability advocates about, and I think the pandemic has actually uh, made more folks talk about how all of the structures of the way that, that government is communicating and communities are communicating needs to be accessible um, 
uh, to folks with disabilities in different languages, et cetera. And so I really appreciate this. And I think it is, I know we've heard it before, um, but I think it's, it is especially timely. Um, and I am wondering, uh, uh, because of the conversation, and I think that there's sort of inequities issues of smaller localities, smaller um, cities who may not have the same kind of IT infrastructure, needing to make sure that folks with disabilities have the same kind of access um, to their jurisdictions. Are there, could you talk at all about, are there, um, seems to me making every small uh, county and city sort of figure this out themselves might be pretty um, inefficient and sort of not take advantage of economies of scale. Um, so is there, is, are there reasons that, that this actually makes sense to do this um, the way you're proposing it? It'd be, it'd be helpful to hear. Thank you, uh, Representative Elkins. Mr. Representative Chair. Elkins. Um, thank you for the, the, the question, Representative Greenman, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I expect, expect that uh, with the first rounds of grants, um, the, uh, one of the objectives will be to uh, establish exemplars and, and templates that, that uh, other cities can use. Um, you know, certainly, I think that, that that's, that's the idea. So use the initial money to you know, create you know, templates, you know, uh, good examples that other, other cities can, can model. You know, all, all of the, the training resources on this come, come down through the uh, Minute Office of Accessibility that has you know, created a, a whole library of, of resources uh, that the council itself, um, cities and, and counties have been adapting to the uh, local government context as, as well. Um, but yeah, I, I don't anticipate that this will be spent to be just doing a series of one-offs with the objective would be to uh, establish templates and best practices and exemplars that, uh, that other cities can model. Representative Greenman. Uh, Thank you, Mr. El or Representative Elkins. Mr. Chair and Representative Elkins, I really appreciate that. And I would just say as a comment, I can't think of a more important investment um, uh, than listening to Minnesotans and making sure that Minnesotans have access to uh, uh, the, the, what their uh, government at whatever level, um, uh, the information that needs to be provided um, with transparency and, and sort of full accessibility. So really appreciate uh, you uh, bringing this forward and the role that uh, the Association of Minnesota Counties and Cities has played as well. So thank you. Uh, next person I got, I've got Representative Quam, then Drzkowski, then Nass. Representative Quam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And the author and I um, had some discussions with LCC and some others about the uh, the links, the resources, and training available um, already um, in the system, which is which is nice and. Having been on a school board where we took advantage of the state's aggregate purchasing and uh, on IT, we uh, you know we save money because you get a better rate. And I've talked with the author about the possibility of leveraging the state for the training because the resources are out there. Um, and maybe answering some questions if people had it. And then uh, with the purchasing, aggregate purchasing, getting a better rate with a higher quality maybe, or a approved list of hosts, uh, that might be a better approach for fiscally uh, assisting a broad range of small cities and counties uh, more um, cost effectively than by um, giving a grant and so you hit one here or one there um, and, and, and frankly I, I think that approach might be a, a more prudent way for us to go because the legislature already has been working hard for years for accessibility uh, has training programs minute has been assisting uh, some of the councils that are very small entities uh, with their websites. So there's expertise. Let's use that and let's help them all instead of uh, having a rotating, growing uh, picking of, of you get it this year and et cetera. So, you know, I've talked to the author and I'm trying to, you know, work on this. Um, I'm, I can understand why the budget went to the health and human services budget, but it all comes out of the same uh, taxpayer pockets. And 
uh, good idea. Let's make it better. And thank you. Uh, Representative Quam, thank you for that. Um, and that's kind of what our our committee process is about: is making, trying to make these bills better as they move along the way. Representative Elkins, did you have any comments on that? Or uh, just a, a brief one, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Quam. Um, we did discuss this, and I I agree with you. Um, it, cur under current state law, uh, support for local governments is not within minutes charter, um, so it would would require additional legislation uh, for a minute to be able to provide uh, direct support to uh, to cities and counties. Uh, that being said, that uh, we, we know that cities and counties are in fact leveraging the training resources and, and, and other resources that the Minute Office of Accessibility provides on, on its own website. Uh, that's being done, I think, very effectively done. And uh, this, um, this bill would just be a, you know, a multiplier for the, the existing efforts of cities and counties and their, and their associations to uh, take advantage of those resources. But I would definitely uh, we'll be willing to work with you to develop legislation that would uh, um, and, and provide funding for for a minute to be able to uh, provide more direct assistance to the state cities and counties to take advantage of those uh, economies of scale. Representative Drskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Elkins. Um, we have before us a bill that's going to increase spending by about a million dollars, as far as I can tell by reading the bill. Um, it seems to me we're, you know, we're, we're going to be facing a budget situation here after the February forecast that is going to say uh, that we are either hundreds or thousands of millions of dollars in the hole. And so uh, to the author, I would ask, um, uh, realizing this is all taxpayer money, uh, re regardless of how you slice it, dice it, or refer it to a committee, um, the question is, how do you plan within the budgetary constraints we have to pay for this bill? Are you planning to make some cuts in programs in order to free up the, the million dollars? Uh, or are you going to increase taxes? And if so, which programs or which taxes? Representative Elkins. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Dreskowski, um, you know, this will is, be part of the, the, the budgeting process. And as I indicated earlier, um, you know, funding is dependent on the, uh, the, the, the budget target that the uh, Human Services Finance Committee uh, receives as part of, the, uh, part of the budgeting process. And it will have to compete with uh, other programs uh, and demands uh, in order to, uh, to warrant, warrant that funding. It's a friendly competition. Representative Skowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sounds like a competition, uh, throwing more shovels in the hole and digging it deeper. Uh, I, I don't really understand. We have before us uh, somebody who testified. Was it AMC, Mr. Chair, uh, that testified? Uh, Representative Jaskowski uh, was the Association of Minnesota Counties and the um, and their IT leadership association so yes that's, that's thank you mr chair well you know and i and i and i've uh, been on the property tax committee for quite a while so we've dealt with amc quite a bit and now they have a daughter or a sister or, or organization i heard uh local government is is growing and coming forward maybe mr chair representative elkins we need to decrease lga in order to pay for your bill thank you mr chair thank you there representative nash You're muted. Okay, that's the first time I've done that. Uh, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. A uh, whole new world of Zoom, yes. Yeah. So I, I guess my question, the other day we heard um, from admin that they were going to be increasing their peel off for uh, administering grants. I believe they were moving it from uh, up to 15%. Maybe Ms. Roberts could help us with that if I got my numbers wrong, she's usually great with, with uh, financial numbers. But so now we're gonna, we're gonna take a million dollars and we're gonna have up to 15% of that peeled off just to administer the grant, which will decrease that down to 850. Um, again, to Representative Quam's point, to Representative Driskowski's point, that it, that is all taxpayer dollars. And again, please do not infer any of my testimony or any of my comments here to be opposed to making websites accessible. 
that's important. But equally as important is the local buy-in. Uh, I remember when I was council and mayor that we would make decisions based on what we were going to spend money on, on uh, our budget. And I, I don't hear any local match. I don't hear any uh, local buy-in. Uh, I, I just think that that's an important component. I haven't heard that. So I would like to hear from uh, from Ms. Roberts if, if the number is indeed 15% and then understand from Representative Elkins or perhaps the, the cities and counties why there is no local uh, match for these grants. Because, uh, I, again, if you're, if you're truly interested in something, I believe that putting some of your own skin in the game is important. Ms. Roberts, um, if you want, can you answer that question? Um, Mr. Chair and Representative Nash, you're correct. The Department of Administration does have a budget um, proposal or a policy proposal. It actually would be um, to have a standard of 5% for legislative lien aid and grants and 10% for competitive grants because there isn't a current standard. Representative Thank you Nash. for that. Thank um, you for that, Ms. Roberts. And uh, Ms. Patton or Ms. Cowell, if you want to uh, answer the question about the about the possible buy-in from the locals, um, our, our match of the of the grants to get the grants. Um. Uh, I can go first, Mr. Chair. If Ms. everyone's Pat. jumping after, <laughs> um, thank Pat. you, um, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, I I think we would be open to that idea. Um, I I don't know. I don't think there would be any opposition either way. I will say that for particularly small counties that are financially overextended right now due to COVID and have very, very limited staff, limited staff hours, it might, at the current moment, it would probably be very difficult to get matching local, local funds um, this year. So maybe the timing isn't quite right on that, whereas in other years, it, it wouldn't be as much of, a, of an issue. Um, so if we want to address this problem right now, that might be a little bit of a hurdle to that. Um, but, you know, into the future, if we if we want to make those dollars extend more, maybe that's an option. But at the present time, I don't think that that would be conducive to kind of addressing the problem promptly in the current financial situation for counties. So. So, Ms. Patton, if we were to pass this without any money and require the counties and the cities to upgrade their um, websites to make them accessible, would that be cons could that be considered an unfunded mandate from the state? It would absolutely be considered an unfunded mandate by the state. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. <laughs> well, my talking points. <laughs> and Representative Mr. Nash. Mr. Chair, to that point, and, and no disrespect to Ms. Patton, cities and counties, yes, they are having a difficult time due to COVID, but it, it should come as no surprise that so is the state. The state has a budgetary problem uh, on, a, on a larger magnitude than, than counties. And again, I'm with you on making these accessible. But money has to come from somewhere. And it's always from the wallet of the people who live in the counties and townships and cities and the state. Uh, I, I'm just advocating for a little bit of realism on this because we, we are having a budget crisis. And you know, so far in our committees, we haven't really reflected that. And I asked the same question. I'm sure Chair Nelson knows that every day we have a committee, I'm going to ask the question of where does the money come from and what are you going to do with less? Because there's less. So, uh, again, fully supportive of the, of the measure. I believe that cities, counties, townships, uh, if they have this in a priority, should figure out a way to manage things on their own, as I did when I was mayor and council member. We, we made priorities and we shifted budgets and we spent less on some things in order to enable others. Um, but there is no money tree that grows in a grove that the state owns. We, we have to be prudent and we have to, to go after priorities. And uh, I just think that this is something that we, we really need to be cognizant of when we are making decisions, one, this early in the, in the season, but two, before we even know what the forecast or our targets are. So thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Claiborne, I, I see you're on the list and I um, pre go ahead with your question. Thank you, Chair Nelson. Um, I have constituents in my district that have visibility 
issues. I have constituents in my district who have hearing impairment. And it's a, it, in comparison to the population of my district, it's a smaller number. But when you think about uh, website accessibility and what that does for our communities, right? So we are asking citizens in small towns and small counties to be engaged, to have skin in the game. That's the conversation that I've just heard. Well, how do you know the discussion is happening in a community if you can't read the website, if you can't hear the discussion, if you don't even know that there is a conversation happening? So it makes it very difficult to get a group of individuals in the community together to advocate for funding at the city and county level if they can't know the conversation is happening. There is a place. So every dollar that we spend in this state, whether it's at the city, county, or state level, comes from a taxpayer, right? It, we're putting it in different buckets, but it still comes out of their pockets. When we spend state money, that is skin in the game for those local taxpayers. They pay money to the state. So it is their money that we're talking about. Um, when we talk about priorities, are we going to fund a, a city or county road in a small town? There was an earlier conversation that I was part of about our infrastructure. Um, when people are talking about, okay, am I gonna do website accessibility for five people? Or am I gonna do a county road or a city road that's going to affect thousands of people? Well, when those decisions are made and those emails are coming in to those city council members, we don't have to guess where that conversation is going to go. So that's a place where the state can step in and help serve all of our members, regardless of their physical ability. And I, I think the conversation of, you know, um, priorities, priorities. Well, when you can't see something, it becomes a priority that you can see. When you can't hear something, it becomes a priority that you can have avail availability to the information. Um, this is a very complicated conversation and we need to think about the greater good. And when we talk about equity in the House of Representatives, this is an equity issue. This is putting our priorities and our values to see and hear and represent every citizen. Representative Elkin, I am so glad you brought this bill forward. It's important, and I'm very glad to be able to support it. Thank you. Representative Elkins, if you want to quickly wrap up, we need to get to a vote, and uh, we're getting running short on time here. Yeah. Representative yes. Elkins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, the I should point out, I mean, it was this obligation has been characterized as an unfunded man mandate, and it is an unfunded mandate coming down to us from the federal government. Uh, cities and counties are required to make their websites accessible according to the American with Disabilities Act. That is not an option. Uh, and uh, Mr. McCourt, uh, if he had been uh, able to attend today and testify, uh, you know, most of us are, are very well uh, acquainted with Mr. McCourt. He's usually a, uh, a fixture around the Capitol when we're able to receive people in person, but he has made a hobby out of suing Carver County and, and cities in Carver County because their websites have not been digitally accessible. I don't know if he's ever um, sued Waconia, uh, wouldn't surprise me actually, but um, you know- the, the target, Elkins, you wanna wrap up here? We, yeah. we, we gotta get to a vote here. Yeah, we're target, out of time. target for this is a city like Elmore represented by former mayor uh, Bjorn Olson with 980 people. They just don't have the money to do this. So Mr. Chair, with that, I will uh, wrap, finish up and I will uh, move that we refer House File 35 to the Committee on uh, Human Services Finance and Policy. So Representative Elkin renews his motion that House File 35, as amended, be referred to the Committee on Human Services, Health and Policy. All those in favor, uh, we uh, represented our Ms. Uh, Spreck, if you want to take the roll. Mayor Nelson? Aye. Vice Chair Carlson? Aye. Representative Nash? No. Representative Bonner? Aye. 
Representative Dreskowski? No. Representative Elkins? Aye. Representative Greenman? Aye. Representative Cleborn? Aye. Representative Kosnick? No. Representative Mason? Aye. Representative New Brindley? Aye. You repeat that? Aye. Thank you. <laughs> Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, aye. Representative Quam? Aye. Uh, 10 ayes and three nays. Uh, with that, the bill is on its way. All members, our next meeting is next Tuesday, the 9th, and we'll be hearing from the Minority Councils and the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council. So members, um, thank you for your time today and have a good weekend. We are adjourned.